Newton theorized, and it is now commonly taught, that the Earth's ocean tides are caused by gravitational lunar attraction. If the moon is only 2,160 miles in diameter, and the Earth 8,000 miles, however, using their own math and law, it follows that the Earth is 87 times more massive, and therefore the larger object should attract the smaller to it, and not the other way around. If the Earth's greater gravity is what keeps the moon in orbit, it is impossible for the moon's lesser gravity to supersede the Earth's gravity at Earth's sea level, where its gravitational attraction would even further outtrump the moon's. Not to mention, the velocity and path of the moon are uniform, and should therefore exert a uniform influence on the Earth's tides, when in actuality, the Earth's tides vary greatly. Furthermore, if ocean tides are caused by the moon's gravitation, how is it that lakes, ponds, and other smaller bodies of standing water remain outside the moon's grasp, while the gigantic oceans are so affected? Thomas Winship wrote, If the moon lifted up the water, it is evident that near the land the water would be drawn away and low instead of high tide caused. Again, the velocity and path of the moon are uniform, and it follows that if she exerted any influence on the earth, that influence could only be a uniform influence, but the tides are not uniform. At Port Natal the rise and fall is about six feet, while at Bera, about 600 miles up the coast, the rise and fall is 26 feet. This effectually settles the matter that the moon has no influence on the tides. Tides are caused by the gentle and gradual rise and fall of the earth on the bosom of the mighty deep. In inland lakes there are no tides which also proves that the moon cannot attract either the earth or water to cause tides. But the fact that the basin of the lake is on the earth which rests on the waters of the deep shows that no tides are possible, as the waters of the lakes together with the earth rise and fall, and thus the tides at the coast are caused, while there are no tides on waters unconnected with the sea. David Wardlaw Scott wrote, even Sir Isaac Newton himself confessed that the explanation of the moon's action on the tides was the least satisfactory part of his theory of gravitation. This theory asserts that the larger object attracts the smaller, and the mass of the moon being reckoned as only one-eighth of that of the earth, it follows that, if by the presumed force of gravitation the earth revolves round the sun, much more for the same reason should the moon do so likewise instead of which that willful orb still continues to go round our world. Tides vary greatly in height, owing chiefly to the different configurations of the adjoining lands. At Chepstow it rises to sixty feet, at Portishead to fifty, while at Dublin Bay it is but twelve, and at Wexford only five feet. That the earth itself has a slight tremulous motion may be seen in the movement of the spirit level, even when fixed as steadily as possible and that the sea has a fluctuation may be witnessed by the oscillation of an anchored ship in the calmest day of summer. By what means the tides are so regularly affected is at present only conjectured. Possibly it may be by atmospheric pressure on the waters of the great deep, and perhaps even the moon itself, as suggested by the late Dr. Robotham, may influence the atmosphere, increasing or diminishing its barometric pressure, and indirectly the rise and fall of earth in the waters. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, It is affirmed that the intensity of attraction increases with proximity and vice versa. How then, when the waters are drawn up by the moon from their bed and away from the earth's attraction, which at that greater distance from the center is considerably diminished, while that of the moon is proportionally increased, is it possible that all the waters acted on should be prevented leaving the earth and flying away to the moon? If the moon has power of attraction sufficient to lift the waters of the earth at all, even a single inch from their deepest receptacles, where the earth's attraction is much the greater, there is nothing in the theory of attraction of gravitation to prevent her taking to herself all the waters which come within her influence. Let the smaller body once overcome the power of the larger, and the power of the smaller becomes greater than when it first operated, because the matter acted on is now nearer to it. Proximity is greater, and therefore power is greater. How then can the waters of the ocean immediately underneath the moon flow towards the shores and so cause a flood tide? Water flows, it is said, through the law of gravity or attraction of the earth's center. It is possible, then, for the moon, having once overcome the power of the earth, to let go her hold upon the waters through the influence of a power which she has conquered, 
and which therefore is less than her own? The above and other difficulties which exist in connection with the explanation of the tides afforded by the Newtonian system have led many, including Sir Isaac Newton himself, to admit that such explanation is the least satisfactory portion of the theory of gravitation. Thus we have been carried forward by the sheer force of evidence to the conclusion that the tides of the sea do not arise from the attraction of the moon, but simply from the rising and falling of the floating earth in the waters of the great deep. That calmness which is found to exist at the bottom of the great seas could not be possible if the waters were alternately raised by the moon and pulled down by the earth. Bearing this fact in mind, that there exists a continual pressure of the atmosphere upon the earth, and associating it with the fact that the earth is a vast plain stretched out upon the waters, and it will be seen that it must of necessity slightly fluctuate or slowly rise and fall in the water. As by the action of the atmosphere the earth is slowly depressed, the water moves towards the receding shore and produces the flood tide, and when by the reaction of the resisting oceanic medium the earth gradually ascends and the waters recede, and the ebb tide is produced. This is the general cause of tides. Whatever peculiarities are observable, they may be traced to the reaction of channels, bays, headlands, and other local causes. That the earth has a vibratory or tremulous motion, such as must necessarily belong to a floating and fluctuating structure, is abundantly proved by the experience of astronomers and surveyors. If a delicate spirit level be firmly placed upon a rock or upon the most solid foundation which it is possible to construct, the very curious phenomenon will be observed of constant change in the position of the air bubble. However carefully the level may be adjusted, and the instrument protected from the atmosphere, the bubble will maintain its position many seconds together. A somewhat similar influence has been noticed in astronomical observatories, where instruments of the best construction are placed in the most approved positions, and cannot always be relied upon, without occasional readjustment. If the moon pulled the tides due to its alleged gravity, then why does it only pull the ocean's water, and not all the world's lakes, marshes, ponds, and other inland waters? The tides are clearly a product of the interconnected ocean waters, and not the other waters of earth, and therefore caused either by the gentle rocking of the earth on the great deep, as stated by the above nineteenth-century authors, or, if more ancient explorers can be trusted, the ocean tides very well may be caused by a huge whirlpool vortex surrounding Mount Maru at the North Pole, which reverses direction every six hours, alternately sucking in and pushing out the great seas of the earth, like the breath of Gaia at the naval center point of earth, breathing in and out twice per day. The 14th century writings Inventio Fortunata by Nicholas Stalin and the Itinerium of Jacobus Snowyen mention the magnetic mountain being so powerful that it pulled the nails right out of explorers' boats. The encircling whirlpool and four directional rivers surrounding the mountain were said to change every six hours causing the tides, comparing them to the breath of God at the navel of the earth, inhaling and exhaling the great seas. The cartographer Gerardus Mercator's 16th century map informs us that the waters of the oceans are carried northward to the pole through these rivers with great force, such that no wind could make a ship sail against the current. The waters then disappear into an enormous whirlpool beneath the mountain at the pole, and are absorbed into the bowels of the earth. On Gerardus Mercator's map he wrote, A monstrous gulf in the sea towards which from all sides the billows of the sea coming from remote parts converge and run together, as though brought there by a conduit, Pouring into these mysterious abysses of nature, they are as though devoured thereby, and should it happen that a vessel pass there, it is seized and drawn away with such powerful violence of the waves, that this hungry force immediately swallows it up, never to appear again. Fritjof Nansen has found mentions of a great northern whirlpool in Norse legends of the world's well, Velgmer, which causes the tides by pushing and pulling waters through its subterranean channels. Isidore of Seville, the Gesta Hemabergenesis Ecclesiae Pontificum, the Topographia Hibernica of Geraldus Cambrensis, his description of the northern whirlpool is cited by Mercator, the Historia Norvege, the Speculum Regal of Einar Gunnarsson, and a particularly interesting quote from the Langobard author Paulus Warnafridi, also called Diaconus, states, and not far from the shore which we before spoke of on the west, where the ocean extends without bounds, 
is that very deep abyss of waters which we commonly call the ocean's navel. It is said twice a day to suck the waves into itself and to spew them out again, as is proved to happen along all these coasts, where the waves rush in and go back again with fearful rapidity. By the whirlpool of which we have spoken, it is asserted that ships are often drawn in with such rapidity that they seem to resemble the flight of arrows through the air, and sometimes they are lost in the gulf with a very frightful destruction. Often, just as they are about to go under, they are brought back again by a sudden shock of the waves, and they are sent out again thence with the same rapidity with which they were drawn in. The Gesta Hammerbergenesis Ecclesiae Pontificum states that Archbishop Adalbert told a team of noblemen of Phrygia, around 1035 to 1043, to set sail to explore the North Polar region. As they headed north beyond Greenland, quote, of a sudden they fell into that numbing ocean's dark mist which could hardly be penetrated with the eyes, and behold, the current of the fluctuating ocean whirled back to its mysterious fountainhead, and with most furious impetuosity drew the unhappy sailors, who in their despair now thought only of death, onto chaos. This, they say, is the abysmal chasm, that deep in which report has it that all the backflow of the sea, which appears to decrease, is absorbed and in turn re-vomited, as the mounting fluctuation is usually described. As the partners were imploring the mercy of God to receive their souls, the backward thrust of the sea carried away some of their ships, but its forward ejection threw the rest far behind the others. Freed thus by the timely help of God from the instant peril they had had before their eyes, they seconded the flood by rowing with all their might. So in short, what is the cause of the tides? Well, it is clearly not the supposed gravity of the moon a smaller object than the earth, far away from the earth, somehow pulling the tides up in a uniform way, as this doesn't happen. Alternately, it could be, as Samuel Robotham proposed, that it is simply the gentle fluctuation of the earth on the waters of the great deep causing the tides. However, this explanation alone fails to provide an answer for the regularity of tides coming in every six hours and going out alternately every six hours to which these ancient explorers offer a possible explanation. And this also, curiously, could be why the flight and sailing restrictions at the North Pole, why people like Rodney Clough were turned away when their vessel tried to explore the North Pole. Russian military vessels and other ships explore the area, making sure that we don't take our own independent explorations to the North Polar region. So what are they hiding there? Does this magnetic Mount Meru actually exist? Is there actually a whirlpool spinning around it with four directional rivers constantly sucking in and pushing out the waters of the earth in six-hour intervals? It sure would be nice if the UN and world governments would allow us to independently explore the Arctic and Antarctic so we could find answers to questions like these.